We're going to read in Luke's gospel tonight. Luke's gospel and chapter 10. It's been over a week since we visited this chapter, so it's time that we take another look at it. Luke chapter 10. And tonight we're just going to read six verses from the story of the Good Samaritan, beginning at verse number 30. And Jesus answering said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance, there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him. And whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. I trust God will bless these six verses to us tonight and give help to explain the gospel and preach the gospel from them. I've told you before that this is one of my favorite passages in Luke's gospel. It's an amazing story. The Lord Jesus in just a few short sentences packed so much of the gospel. He was the master at it. He could take things so complex like the gospel or even the complexity of, of making a man. And very simply, the word of God says he formed man. What was in that forming of man? Doctors still can't figure out today. But God has a way of very simply putting into words something that's beyond complex. And the Lord Jesus tells this simple story. And yet in this simple story, there's so much complexity concerning the gospel. I just want to look at three things from it tonight. Three, maybe four. I'll watch the clock, see how the time goes. But I got three things that are upon my heart. And they're found in a few words in verse number 30. Jesus answering said, a certain man went down. A certain man went down. Those are our words for tonight. I want to talk to you about going down. If Brody would adjust his screen, those of you that can see it, and when you do see it later, you'll see the two roads chart. And on that chart, there's a downward road. He stands in front of it every night and preaches the gospel from it. And I want to just speak to you about one part of that chart tonight, the downward course, the downward road. In the words of the Lord Jesus, a certain man went down. He had somebody in mind. Whenever the Lord Jesus used the expression, a certain man, he was thinking about a certain man. And just before this, there's a certain lawyer that stood up to tempt him. And I have no doubt that the Lord Jesus is thinking about the certain lawyer. And he tells him about a certain man that went down. It was a very kind way of the Lord Jesus pointing out to the man that he was on the wrong road. He was on a downward course. 
You know, my friend, direction matters. Don't you forget that. Direction matters. The downward road is going the wrong direction. And no matter what you do on that road, and no matter how you live on that road, it's still heading in the wrong direction. You can be a very good neighbor on the downward road. You're still going in the wrong direction. You can be a scholar, you can be a doctor, you can be a lawyer, but if you're still on that road, you are going the wrong direction. And in the end, that's what matters. Direction matters. It depends where you are, what way you're going. And everybody on that road, that broad road, is going in the wrong direction. You need to understand that. Whether you're a Christian's child or whether you've never heard the gospel before, whether you're a blasphemer and a blackguard or whether you're a moral and upright living citizen, if you're on that road, you are going the wrong direction. And it's the direction that's going to take you to your destination. And nothing you can do will stop that. As long as you're on the downward road, you are going the wrong direction. It's the natural road. It's the natural course of man. It is actually the course of nature. Everything in nature moves downward. Everything in nature is breaking down. Things get old. Things fall apart. Things don't get better. They get older. Things don't get... Uh, what can I say? It's it, it just nothing is moving upward. Everything is moving downward. Water flows downhill. It's the direction of the weak. You don't have to be a very sw strong swimmer to go with the current. The current moves downward. It is the natural course. Gravity pulls downward. Everything moves downward. Water flows downward. The problem is this. You get caught in that current. It takes more than your power to get out of it. That's why we're preaching the gospel. Because nothing you can do can go against that current. The current is taking you downward. It's taking you away. It's taking you to the wrong place. It's taking you to a place while you might joke about it and use it as a swear word. Hell is a real place at the end of the downward road. It is the natural course of man. And all you have to do to end up in hell is just keep going. Just keep going. Make no stop, make no changes, just keep going and you'll end up in the wrong place. It's the downward natural course. But it's the devil's course. Let me remind you that he is the prince on that road. He is the king of that road. There was an older chart than the one we're using now, and it had a crown on that road. He's the king of that road. And while he tells you you're free to do whatever you like on that road, you're really not free. You're under a, a dominating and domineering master. You're under the master of Satan himself. It's his road. He's the liar. He's the king of lies. In fact, he will so entrap you with sin. And while you think you're doing the sinning and you're controlling sin and you're enjoying sin, the Bible gives us the other side of the story. Whoever serves sin is the master of sin. Sin is your master. You're being controlled. It is the devil's road. It is the downward road. And it lands in hell and the lake of fire eventually. A certain man went down. Let me just stop for a minute. Anybody listening to me tonight that's on that road? Come on, be honest. Anybody listening tonight on that downward road? That could end tonight.
you could meet your destination tonight. There are many determining factors on this road. Not only is it a downward course, but you don't have control. There are other factors that determine how you live on that road and what happens to you on that road. There are things that are beyond your control. There are factors that you cannot control. Let's talk about friends, first of all. Friends. Do you ever get in a car with a friend driving? Your life is in your friend's hands. Do you ever get on an airplane and you're hoping that the pilot is a friendly type of fella? Your life is in his hands. And you have no control over that. Just a few years ago, German Wings Flight 9525, the pilot was not a friendly man. He greeted the people when they got on board, and yet he had every determination in his mind already made up. He was going to commit suicide and take the whole plane with him. There were perfectly innocent people on that plane. And there was a factor that they couldn't control. That's the way it is on the downward road. Young man got into an argument with his mother and he stormed out of the house and went off to the club, to the bar. He was standing at the bar. Some of his friends were around him. And they noticed that something was wrong with them. And they said, Bob, what's the matter with you? You look like you're angry or something. Oh, he said, I just had an argument with my mother. And they pressed him and pressed him and they wanted to know what the argument was about. So finally he told them, she wanted me to go to a gospel meeting tonight. And I told her I had friends, I had an appointment with my friends tonight. Then his friends started to tease him. A gospel meeting, Bob. A gospel meeting. Really? Oh, Bob, you're still tied to your mother's apron strings. Bob pushed back from the bar. And he looked at those boys. And he said, you're my friends? He says, which one of you will go to hell for me? There was no answer. Well, he said, then why should I go to hell for you? And Bob turned and left that bar. And a short time later, Bob was saved. The friends factor. There's things that you would only do for friends. Come on, you dress the way you dress because of your friends. Even your children do. You get your hair cut the way it is because of your friends. You don't want to be different. You go where you go because of your friends. And yet the very friends that you are willing to shape your life by and live your life by, not a one of them would be willing to go to hell for you. Not a one. And yet there you are going to hell for them. The friends factor. But we've been reminded the last couple days about the foes factor. Not everybody is your friend. When people are feeling safe, locked in their houses, the world come to a shutdown, some crazy man takes a, a gun and goes around shooting people. People had no control over that. And while we feel for the poor people, and the families that are bereft of loved ones. There are crazy nuts in this world. There are people that you have no control over. Here's the man in the story. He's going about his own business. He's traveling down the downward road and he falls among wicked men. He falls among thieves. They care nothing for his soul. 
There are people in this world that care nothing for your soul, that care nothing for your life, and they'd snuff it out in a moment, like it's just happened in Nova Scotia. You're traveling on that broad road, careless, and you have no control, no control over what some madman may do. You need to be saved. You need to get off that road. This poor man, going about his own business, fell among wicked men, fell among thieves. They stripped him, they wounded him, and they left him to die. They could care less about him. They just left him to die. Just another statistic on the side of the road. And that's all you'll be, my friend. You need to get off that road. You make up your mind this very night. If I do nothing else this week, if I do nothing else this night, I must get off this road. I must be saved. Take to heart the words of the Lord Jesus. You must be born again. Take to heart the words of the apostle Peter. We must be saved. That's why they said it like that. Because there's things that happen on that downward road that you have no control of. There's the friends. There's the foes. But there's also the falls. Many an accident on that downward road. Many a person has fallen on that downward road. Many a person has gone down through no fault of their own, through no fault of anybody else. That's life, friend. Accidents happen. Falls happen. And people die on the downward road. That's the tragedy of it. Whatever happens on that road, you end up in the destination at the end of the road. That's why we're insisting you must get off the road. This is not a cleanup job. This is not pull yourself up by the bootstrap. This is not just a makeover or a new leap. Get off the road. It's a dangerous road to be living on. Anything happens to you on that road, you'll end up in the wrong place. You'll end up in hell. I know. If you're anything like me, we always think it's going to be the other fella. It'll never happen to me. I'll just carry on. I'll be very careful. I'll just carry on. Somebody sent me a link the other day. Maybe I picked it up off the news, but there was a little video of a, of a propane truck. And the driver was texting, they figure, driving a massive trailer truck loaded with propane. And he didn't realize that the trucks in front of him were stopped. And he plowed into that, and that tanker exploded like a fireball. Innocent people just sitting on the road. Innocent people thinking everything's all right, under control controlling their own trucks, controlling their own speed. And yet another man, and an accident happened, and lives were snuffed out, and they had no control of it, and neither do you. The determining factors. But the reason I'm speaking on this is because they all have disastrous results. This is a message of warning, my friend. There are disastrous results on this road. The very people, the very people that you might be counting on to, to, to stop and help you, the very people, maybe your spiritual advisors, maybe some preacher, maybe some priest, maybe some pastor, the very people you're putting your stock in, your hope in for eternity, they'll look after my spiritual affairs. No, my friend. The very man that this man thought, here comes the priest, he'll help me. He passed him by. That's astounding. He passed him by. He could say he cares all he wants, but if he doesn't stop, he doesn't care. When push comes to shove, if he doesn't stop, he doesn't care. And he passes the man by. And Mr. Do-Good comes down the road, who's always preaching, turn over a new leaf, 
work for God, work harder, do better. He passes by the Levite. He doesn't care. And the very people that this man thought would care for his soul didn't care. And the disaster is this. He's left to die on the downward road. That is the greatest disaster that could ever befall you, my friend. To die on that downward road. Would you listen again what the Lord Jesus said? If ye die in your sins, if ye die on that downward road, that's what he's talking about. If ye die in your sins, where I am, you cannot come. Oh, my friend, wake up. It's time to get off that road before disaster strikes. Now, while you're in your right mind. Now, children, while you're young. Now is the time to seek the Lord. Now is the time to turn to the Lord Jesus. While you can, don't put it off. This is the day of salvation. This is the time God would save you. For if you die on that road, Nothing and no one can save you. No one can save you. The disaster. But before I sit down, I do want to remind you of the divine deliverer. Because there was someone coming that road. No, no, he wasn't going down the road. He was going upward. He's going toward Jerusalem. You say, well, you're, you're just reading that. In. No, the Lord Jesus was going toward Jerusalem. He's on his way to Jerusalem in Luke chapter 10. If you just turn back a chapter, Luke chapter 9, verse number 51, says he set his face toward Jerusalem. The time had come when he should be received up. He set his face toward Jerusalem. This is the very next chapter. The Lord Jesus is moving up. He's going, he's the only one going upward on that road. He's the only one that never traveled downward. He came from heaven and he traveled to Calvary, to Jerusalem, to lay down his life. The Lord Jesus, there's never been a, a man like him to walk the road of life. He's walking upward every step that he takes. He has never taken a step downward. Can I introduce you to him tonight? And as this meeting continues later, we seek to bring you to Christ. We preach unto you the Lord Jesus. He is the man you need to meet. Pilate one day presented him to the people, unknowingly, unwittingly, not knowing he was preaching the gospel. He says, behold the man. That's what we would say to you tonight. Behold this man. There's never been another man like him. He's the Lord from heaven. He's come along to find people that are lost on that downward road. There is a divine deliverer tonight. You can be saved from your sins. Thank God for everyone. I don't care how wounded, how bruised, how beat up you are on that road. Here's a man, the scripture says he's half dead. He's half dead. And yet the deliverer comes along. A man comes alongside. Oh, what a friend. He didn't know him. He didn't even know his name. And yet a man comes alongside and he stoops down to help him. I don't know what you're so afraid of being saved for. I really don't. I was, but I don't know why. Every one of us was in that position once. He's come alongside to help. He's come alongside to save. He will only do you good. Can you imagine this man on the side of the road pushing him away? Saying, no, not now. Don't save me now. When I feel like I'm dying. Listen, friend, he was dying. He's already half dead. Oh, don't you understand it? You're dying on that road. You're already dead in trespasses and in sins. You are spiritually dead. You need a savior. Do not, my friend, do not push him away again tonight. You've done that in nights past. Do not say some other night. Tonight is the night. 
He's come alongside to save you tonight. Let him save you. You would let him. He would. You don't need to figure this out. If you would let him, he would. I don't hear any conversation or argument from this man to the man that comes along to save him saying, how are you going to do this, mister? I don't know how you can save me. I don't know how I'm going to get on that beast. I don't know if I'm too far gone. Nothing like that. Not a thing. He just silently let the man save him. Would you let the Lord save you tonight? He has the power. He is able to save to the uttermost. I was just reading it this morning. Hebrews chapter 7. He is able to say also to save to the uttermost all that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. He is able to save. No one else is able, but he is able to save. Behold the man. You know, almost any man can take your life. but only one man can give you life. There are wicked men that would take your life. And that's why Nova Scotia and the Maritime Provinces are in mourning right now. And RCMP officers are mourning right now because one wicked man took other people's lives. But oh, my friend, I don't want to dwell on that. I want you to turn to one righteous man, the only man that can give you life. He is the life giver. I am the way, the truth, listen, and the life. He is life. He gives life. He gives life to those that are half dead. He gives life to those that are dead in trespasses and in sins. He would give you life tonight. That's what he does. He stoops beside this man. He bows down. He bowed his head by this man. He lifts a man by his own power. He poured in oil and wine. He lifts him up. He sets him on his beast. And he took care of him. It was all him. He did all the work. Night after night, Mr. Thibodeau and I have been telling you about the finished work of Christ. He does the work, not you. People trying to figure out God's salvation. There is nothing for you to figure out, friend. All the figuring was done by God. All the work was done by the Lord Jesus. When he paid the price for our sin, and pay it he did, would you let him save you? He would draw alongside of you tonight as this meeting continues. He would draw alongside and reach out his hand to save you. I'm going to give you some good advice. As you listen, don't draw back. Don't pull away. Let him save you. He delights. He's the divine savior. He's the divine deliverer. He loves to save sinners. Very good. Amen. Let's read together in the Old Testament next, please. The Old Testament... In the book of 1 Samuel, I'm going to read in three or four different portions to get the information from a story that illustrates the grace of God and the reason why God would save any of us and can save any of us. 1 Samuel chapter 20 Beginning at verse number 11. First Samuel 20 and verse number 11. And Jonathan, and that's a name I want you to remember. And Jonathan said unto David, come and let us go out into the field. And they went out, both of them, into the field. They're having a conversation here. And in verse number 14, the words of Jonathan. And thou shalt not only while I yet or while yet I live show me the kindness of the Lord that I die not 
but also thou shalt not cut off thy kindness from my house forever. No, not when the Lord hath cut off the enemies of David, every one from the face of the earth. Verse number 15 again. But also thou shalt not cut off thy kindness from my house forever. From my house is a way of saying my descendants, those who would be connected with my name after me. Second Samuel, please. Second Samuel chapter 4. In 2 Samuel chapter 4 and verse number 4, we're introduced or reintroduced to the name Jonathan. And Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son that was lame of his feet. That means he was crippled. He was five years old when the tidings or the news came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel, and his nurse took him up and fled. And it came to pass as she made haste to flee, that he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. That's a difficult one to say, but Mephibosheth. Chapter 8, please. Second Samuel, chapter 8. Verse number 15. And David reigned over all Israel. And David executed judgment and justice unto all his people. Chapter 9 and verse 1. And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? The word kindness in this passage is the same idea as grace. And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Maker, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. Then king David sent and fetched him out of the house of Maker, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? Verse number 10 tells us about Ziba and what he's going to do to the land. Um, says in verse 10, But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. And then we come in to verse number 11. Then said Ziba unto the king, According to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. Verse 13, So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table, and was lame, on both his feet. Let's read in chapter 19, just for a few verses. Second Samuel chapter 19, verse 24. And Mephibosheth, the son of Saul, came down to meet the king and had neither dressed his feet nor trimmed his beard nor washed his clothes. From the day the king departed until the day he came again in peace. And it came to pass when he was come to Jerusalem to meet the king, that the king said unto him, Wherefore wentest not thou with me, Mephibosheth? And he answered, My lord, O king, my servant deceived me. It's an important phrase. Verse 27, 
and he hath slandered thy servant unto my lord the king. Verse 29, and the king said unto him, Why speakest thou any more of thy matters? I have said, Thou and Ziba divide the land. And Mephibosheth said unto the king, Yea, let him take all for as much as my lord the king is come again in peace unto his own house. Mephibosheth. I couldn't help but think as our brother Jonathan was relating to us the story of the man who was on the downward road to Jericho how it would have been quite silly for that man to resist the kind-hearted reaching out of a man who is so gracious. And then I thought of sinners. Sinners who listen to these gospel meetings night after night and consider the implications of salvation. They consider, if I were to receive Christ, it would change my life. I hope you understand that receiving Christ would change your life. I hope you understand that it would change your life in significant ways. The fact is, salvation will change your life morally. It has to. The salvation that we are preaching from the Bible will change your eternal destiny. Guaranteed to. But it will change your life. And you're looking at the life you have now and all of the aspirations that you have, and you're looking at the relationships that you have, and you're looking at all of the things that you could have. And you're weighing it up. I want to just relate to you this story about a man who came to know the grace of the king. He came into the benefit of the great kindness and loving mercy of this king. And as we go through it, I'm going to ask you to think with me. How does Mephibosheth apply to me? How do I fit into this story? How am I like him? And when we see that, you're going to have to be honest because there are certain things in the life of Mephibosheth that are not very pleasant to face. And yet a thinking, honest person is able to find rest in Christ tonight. I read in 1 Samuel chapter 20 first, in order to establish for us, first of all, the foundation upon which grace can be shown. We look back and we see not Mephibosheth, in 1 Samuel chapter 20, but we see David and his connection to Jonathan. If I was to take you back a few chapters earlier, we would have seen Jonathan and his love for David. After David had gone into the Valley of Elah and accomplished the victory over the giant and come up again, he begins to speak with Saul. And when Jonathan hears the words of David as he spoke to Saul, the heart of Jonathan was knit with the heart of David, or the soul of Jonathan was knit with the heart of David. And there was a love there between the two. But in chapter 20, we now have David, because of his love for Jonathan, giving him a promise. This is going to be the foundation upon which all blessing will flow. Don't miss it. Because if you miss this, you miss the point of the story. Because of David's love for Jonathan, he makes a promise. Jonathan, any person connected to you, any person connected with your name, I will show kindness. I will show mercy. Don't miss it. All of the blessing is going to flow as a, as a result of David's promise to Jonathan. All connected to you will be blessed. And we fast forward now to 2 Samuel chapter 4 as the time flies. And we find that a major event has taken place. It is the death of Jonathan in that hill in Jezreel. It is the death of Jonathan that causes the crisis. It is the death of Jonathan that causes uh, the, the, the nurse or the one who is looking after Mephibosheth to pick him up. And as she picks him up and begins to run, she trips. They fall. And because of that fall, 
He is left lame on both of his feet. And most gospel preachers will begin here by telling you that's a picture of a sinner, right? But I'm going to begin a step earlier and show you how Mephibosheth is a picture of a sinner before that even happened. Why? In those days, when a king would, would be in battle, and then he would be overtaken, and the king was killed, oftentimes what would happen is that the winning side would look at, at the other side, and they would say, we're going to kill all of the males in the family of the defeated king. That king has been defeated. We don't want anyone to rise up, so every male in his family is going to be slain. That is a decree from the king. So that means in very simple terms, even in, in New Testament biblical terms, every person connected with the first king is condemned. And herein we have the first picture of a sinner in the life of Mephibosheth. Because of his connection to Saul, and if things had gone the way that they commonly would go, and the way even that some would think they should go, because of his connection with the first man, Saul, he's condemned. His life is at risk. Why else would that woman run with this boy, other than the fact that he was at risk? And our New Testament tells us that before you ever sinned even once, your connection with Adam has you condemned. According to the Bible, as in uh, by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, so death passed upon all men and that all has sinned, that is expressing our connection to Adam and it has brought us in to sin and condemnation. Adam is called the first man in the scriptures. You will find also, so as in Adam, all die. And it born into this world, whether you realize it or not, whether you've realized it or not up to this point, your connection to Adam has caused you to be condemned. So was Mephibosheth. And now you step forward to that day when she drops him. And as a result of a fall, he's now helpless. Powerless. And I don't have to stretch your imagination to see the parallel with New Testament truth. We go back to the Garden of Eden. And in the Garden of Eden, we watch as that man and that woman take of that fruit and they eat. And we refer to that as the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. And as a result of that fall, everyone since then is powerless. Helpless, without strength to even muster any kind of merit with God. Mephibosheth, condemned because of his connection to Saul, is like us, condemned in Adam. Mephibosheth, helpless as a result of the fall, is like we sinners who, because of the fall, have no power to save ourselves. But if we go a step further, Mephibosheth's very name is connected with shame. So sin, condemnation, and shame. He grows up to be a man who lives in a place called Lodibar. That word is it, not a simple word for us, but it means a very simple thing. It either means that there's no word there or there's no pasture there, and you could debate that all night, but I'm going to boil it down to one simple phrase. The man who is condemned because of his connection to Saul, helpless because of the fall, shameful in his nature, is in a place of no hope. And in that place of no hope, whether or not it was warranted, he feared the king. He was hiding from the king. He was hiding from David because of what he thought David wanted to do to him. Oh, my dear friend. That was a preacher phrase, by the way. I very seldom use that. Just caught myself. Dear friend. 
Can't you see it tonight? Can't you see your situation? Don't you understand even a little bit of the shame connected with your sin and the seriousness of sin, the condemnation of sin, the helplessness that you are in, the hopelessness that you are in? Don't you see it? And you can't tell me that that very condition has not made you fear the God of all eternity, to fear standing before him, to fear having to meet him. And you may stand back tonight and not knowing the biblical scriptural presentation of the holy, just, and loving, and kind, and gracious God, and you have nothing but fear thinking that the God of eternity only wants to crush me. The God of eternity only wants to hurl me into a lake of fire. And you're running and moving in fear. That's why your life thus far has been a life of hiding. It's been a life of running. It's been a life of fleeing. Every time the gospel gets close, you draw back. Every time God reaches out, you turn away. Every time God calls your name, you find something to hide under. You find something to hide in. You find a chemical to drown that voice. Because you fear the king. But listen, listen to this. The king that you are fearing has a message of hope for you. And I can just see it. I see things. I picture David as being a man. I'll not tell you exactly what I think he looks like. I don't know if he looks special or not. I don't know what ruddy means, and nobody's been able to describe that properly to me but I have it in my own mind. When this man, David, comes, and because of a heart of kindness, he remembers, I'm not saying that he forgot, but he basically says, it's time now. It's time now. Is there anybody connected to Saul that I can show grace to because of Jonathan. There just happened to be a man there and said, yes, there is one. There is one. It says here, we're going to go and call this servant. And the servant comes and David says again, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son which is lame on his feet. Now, if you're reading with me, I'll expect you to pick up my mistake here. And the king said unto him, what's his name? You know, it doesn't say that, does it? Why doesn't the king ask his name? Doesn't matter what his name is. It's irrelevant. The only thing that matters is if he's connected to Jonathan. That connection to Jonathan brings him in to the grace that David is going to offer. This man is not going to receive kindness and mercy and grace because of Mephibosheth's sake. This man is going to receive all of the blessing. He's going to be brought into the presence of the king. He's going to sit at the king's table. He's going to eat the best of the best and be continually comforted while he is there. Why? For Jonathan's sake. Everything hinges on Jonathan in this story. And Jonathan, for us, of course, is a picture of our Lord Jesus. Mephibosheth, a picture of a sinner who is condemned and helpless and shameful and hopeless and fearing the king. David is a picture of God who according to chapter 8, he reigned, and he reigned in judgment and justice. He was always going to do that which is right. He's a picture of God as the king. And Jonathan is a picture of the Lord Jesus. Why? Because... All the blessing that God has for you tonight flows not through the gospel hall. It flows not through the preachers. It, and it definitely doesn't flow through Zoom and YouTube. 
Where does it flow through? A man. And that man is Jesus Christ. We call him Lord Jesus Christ. And don't forget, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what your name is. The blessing is going to flow not because of you, but because of Christ. Here, we have this man. He sends, sends a message. You know, I feel bad. I feel bad for gospel preachers who try their best to get around preaching, believing in the gospel. I don't know why they do it. They might have their reasons. They might fear that they're, they're confusing things. Brethren, it's all throughout our Bible. Mephibosheth is going to hear a message. Now, I can just picture as David sends the messenger... He's also, remember, he's going to send all of the material that is necessary to remove Mephibosheth from Lodibar and bring him into the presence of the king. He's assuming that Mephibosheth doesn't have anything, living in such a place. No hope. But as he sends the resources and he sends the message, there's a response that is expected. There must be a response expected. If the message comes to Mephibosheth and he locks the door and he doesn't let them in because of fear of the king, he'll never receive the blessing. If the message comes to Mephibosheth and he he hustles his servants together and he says, put me on that beast of burden and get me out of here. The king is after me. The king has sent an entourage and my life is in danger. He could do that. And you know, there are those when they hear the gospel who are fearful. They remain unbelieving. But the only response that will allow David to bless him, remember, Jonathan is the reason he's going to bless. But the only response that will allow David to bless him is I will go. It's the only thing. And as those men come, I can see with a little hesitation, Mephibosheth consents. He says, I'll go. You can just see these men, they take Mephibosheth and all of the things that that, uh, are pertinent to his life. They remove him from Lodibar. They place him in the king's wagons. They use the king's resources to remove him from the place of no hope and bring him into the very presence of the king that he once feared. And is there anything better than that in all the face of the earth? You know what I'm saying? I'm saying that God wants to bless you with salvation. This salvation is in a man the Lord Jesus Christ. Because of God's love for his beloved son, the Lord Jesus, he makes a promise. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He that believeth on the son hath everlasting life. He that hath the son hath life. God has given unto us eternal life, and this life is in his son. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Out through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And he reaches out now, and he reaches out with a message. And if you respond to the message by believing what God says, placing your faith in the Lord Jesus, you know what happens? God does the rest. It really is the power of God that removes you from being in the family of Adam and places you in Christ. It is the power of God that takes you out of the kingdom or the power of darkness and translates you into the kingdom of his son. It is the power of God that removes you off of that broad road and places you on the narrow road. It's the power of God that puts within you the very life of God himself. 
It's the power of God that erases, that cleanses, that purges your sins. It is the power of God that gives the peace of God. It is the power of God that causes the new birth. It is the power of God that gives you eternal life. It's all the power of God that removes you from the place of no hope and brings you into the place of endless blessing. It's all the power of God. And when Mephibosheth said, I will go, David's resources took care of the rest. He brings him now, or they bring him now into the presence of the king. And things are a little bit real now. (laughs) Because the man who believed the message back in Lodibar starts to shake a little. Why? Why? He's human. Maybe a little bit of doubt. Maybe a little bit of worry. You know, the only thing, now listen closely. The only thing that's going to give this man confidence is to hear the words of the king. Nothing else can give that confidence. As he's going there on the wagon toward the king's house, what's going on? There are servants there. He could ask the servant, so are you sure? Are you sure that the king wants me? Yes, don't worry, Mephibosheth. Yeah, but you're just a servant. Your word's not important. He might ask another servant, or he might ask some of the people as he's entering into the city. And as he sits down, or or as he is caused to sit now in, in the king's palace, and he's waiting for the king to come in, he could be full of doubt and full of worry. But he can't settle until he has the word of the king. Was he there as a result of believing the message at first? Yes. But, oh, my friends, the only thing that can put to rest the doubts that even a true believer might have is the word of the king. And when I look at this, I see Mephibosheth in the presence of David. He falls on his face. He does reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth, fear not, I promise. That's what it means, I will surely, I promise. I'm going to show you such kindness as you've never been exposed to. I'm going to show you what it really means. when someone really cares and really gives. And it's all because of Jonathan. You rest. You have my word. (sighs) Don't rest till you have his word. But when you have his word, you can rest. And here we have it. Again, PEI. It's weird in PEI today. It's snowing outside and the clock's about 10 minutes fast. But here we have it. That I may show the kindness of God unto him for Jonathan's sake. I'm going to take three minutes of your time. When we come... To chapter 19, please remember, Mephibosheth was not brought to the king because of himself. It was because of Jonathan. Mephibosheth did not remain with the king because of himself. It's because of Jonathan. But now circumstances come up. And as David is coming back after fleeing from Absalom, he finds Mephibosheth. 
And Mephibosheth, it says, he had uh, neither dressed his feet nor trimmed his beard or washed his clothes from the day that the king departed. If you were to look at Mephibosheth when David is returning from fleeing from Absalom, you would say, that's a man who once sat at the king's table? Look at his beard. Look at his clothes. Look at his feet. Smell that smell. He doesn't look like, and he doesn't sound like, and he doesn't smell like a man who once sat at the king's table. But Mephibosheth is going to tell us, or tell David exactly what happened. He says, I was deceived. And after I was deceived, that same person who deceived me slandered me to you. And you say, what are you getting at now, keeping us over time to go over these things? It's a picture of a believer on the Lord Jesus. Really saved. Not pretend to be saved. Really saved. Who's been taken from the place of no hope, caused to sit at the king's table. And Ziba is a picture of Satan. The deceiver. The slanderer from the Bible. And he will do whatever it takes to make that child of God miserable. He can. And according to the Bible, we know that he slanders that same child of God in the presence of God when he can. And it may be that there's someone listening to my voice tonight, and there was a time when you enjoyed the things of God. You enjoyed sitting at the king's table. You appreciated your Bible. You appreciated the Lord Jesus. You appreciated the Lord's people. And then you remember this. You were saved only because of Christ. You enjoyed God's presence only because of Christ. And if you're away from the Lord now, remember, David comes back and he looks at this man. You have some questions for him. But I can't help but see. As David looks at this man who looked nothing like his former self, David wouldn't say, oh, Mephibosheth, what am I going to do? I can't help but think that as David looked at that man, all he could think of is Jonathan. David, you promised, no matter what happens, that man is blessed for my sake. These gospel meetings are a great opportunity for sinners to be saved. But for people who are listening, who even used to gather with us and enjoy the things of God, God wants you. He has never given up on you. And when he looks at you, he doesn't see a disgrace. When he looks at you, he still sees you in Christ. <laughs> that I may show him the kindness of God for Jonathan's sake. We'll pray.